All right, everybody, I have to introduce myself today. So I'm Austin Aki. I'm part of the CNS Imaging team. Uh, I'm going to be giving you a talk about one of our newer tools down at CNS, which is the Low Energy Electron Microscope, which is a very unusual capability that we've got at CNS. You won't find it a lot of other places. I'm going to try to avoid too much microscopy jargon under the assumption that not everybody is super familiar with the innards of electron microscopes. And I'm not going to throw equations at anybody because nobody likes those anyway to talk. Uh, if you guys have got questions or get lost or can't hear me or anything, just wave frantically or like throw something and I'll try and get to you. Okay? Good, off we go. So, um, oh God, well, off to a great start. Click on that now. Hey, all right. Uh, so this is a low energy electron microscope. It's a great big steel octopus of a thing. It's got all sorts of bits and ports and knobs and all sorts of crazy crud. And we're gonna talk about what it does um, after I get through my sort of overview slides here. So what do you do with this thing? This is a surface microscope. You got a piece of material, you wanna look at its surface. This is a microscope that does that. It doesn't do anything else. It doesn't look at the inside of the material. It doesn't look at the back of the material. It only looks at surfaces and only the top couple atomic layers of the surface. That means it's really good for 2D materials, your, you know, calcogenide transition metals and your graphenes, but not so great for like buried IC structures or anything like that. It is an ultra high vacuum tool or UHV, which means that your sample has to sit in 10 to the minus 10 millibars of vacuum. Uh, if you're not familiar with vacuum terminology, uh, that is extremely, extremely empty space. That is sort of interplanetary space level of vacuum. Uh, which means that we have to go to a lot of trouble to get and stay there. So we also have to make sure your sample will tolerate that kind of thing. It has to be at that low pressure because we're spitting electrons back and forth and they're going real slow. And if there are gas atoms around, they will crash into the electrons and ruin everything. It has a heating and cooling stage. So in addition to moving your sample around, we can get it hot and we can get it cold. Cold in this case is 120 Kelvin, which by the standards of cryo, is not particularly cold, cold-ish. And hot is greater than 2000 Kelvin, which is hot by almost anybody's standards, except for the plasma people. Uh, so we can probably melt most materials. Uh, we don't want to, because it makes a mess, but we can certainly get them hot enough to change their surfaces. And we can do this in the presence of some gases to cause surface terminations to change and mess with their crystal structure. Um, spatial resolution on this tool, about two nanometers. So you're not going to be seeing individual atoms on this tool, but you will see a lot of other stuff. And that is because our particular tool has a component called an aberration corrector, which I'm not going to talk about. It's just a thing that makes the resolution better. There are a lot of ways you can use this tool. There's all these lovely acronyms here, and we're going to go through all of them, uh, talking about what you can do and how they work and why you might want to use them. Um, it's also very customizable. As you can see, this is not a neatly packaged sort of white cube with a couple buttons on the outside. This is an extremely manual kind of instrument, but that means it's got all these nice ports and windows. So if you want to bolt something onto it, we can. If somebody wants to, for example, sputter material in C2 and watch that happen or grow films, plenty of ports for evaporators, plenty of ports for other types of light sources to do different kinds of experiments. Very, very customizable tool. Um, we also have, for people who know what this acronym means, uh, MBE, molecular beam uh, epitaxy, we have a way of shuttling samples under ultra-high vacuum between growth chambers and this tool without them ever seeing air, which is very important because a lot of these materials are air-sensitive, and if they go out into the world, they're ruined, and then there's no point in even looking at them. Samples. First thing in any electron microscopy talk probably ought to be uh, your samples. What can you put into these instruments? So the sample carrier, this is the front, this is the back, this little metal box. Your sample has to sit inside it and look out through this hole, which is a four millimeter hole. The sample has to fit in this little space here, which is a 10 millimeter circle. Uh, and it has to obey these rules. It has to be flat, it has to be conductive, and it has to be clean. Flat means polished to a mirror finish, kind of flat. No bumps or texture more than tens of nanometers. If you've got great big one micron pillars, you're not gonna be imaging them with this tool. Conductive doesn't mean ridiculously conductive. Metal foils are great, but we can get by with a couple of other substrates like strontium titanate or silicon with just native oxide on it. Uh, thick silicon oxide is not going to work unless you put gold on it before you put your sample on top. 
uh, and sapphire is absolutely not going to happen. In other electron microscopies, we will solve the conductivity problem by sputtering some gold or something on top of your sample. You can totally do that here, and then all you'll see is gold because it's a surface microscope, and all it looks at is the surface. Uh, sample should be less than 8 by 8 millimeters square, more than 4 millimeter diameter circle, otherwise it would fall through the hole and fall out. But I've made a bunch of different adapter plates for different size samples, including TM grids and things, so we can accommodate most people's materials as long as they're not really big. And then clean. Clean is the biggest problem. Clean means ultra high vacuum surface clean, and that is a pretty strict set of requirements. If we're going to look at the outer atomic ventilator of your sample, that means you can't have any water on it. Everything in the entire world that's ever seen the Earth has at least a couple monolayers of water bonded to its surface because surface tension is just that strong. And it doesn't just come off because you put it in vacuum. You have to heat it up enough to boil it away, which means we have to degas your sample at 120C under vacuum conditions to get the water off of it. If your sample doesn't like 120C, we can't do that. You know, if your sample is going to sublime or change crystal structure or something. Um, Frequently, we want to go a lot hotter than that. A lot of people's samples have hydrocarbons on them because, you know, they got their glove on it or something um, or other issues with bits of surface oxide. So we'll use that heating stage to raise them up hot enough to boil whatever's on your sample off, assuming your sample is still scientifically meaningful afterwards. Or we have to be able to clean it in some other fashion. If you've got the kind of flaky materials that you can peel with tape, we can set it up to peel with tape inside the uh, either the glove box and then suitcase it in or in the instrument itself. Uh, or there are some tricks involving ion beam cleaning that we can do, uh, or you grow your sample in C2 or, or, or there's a bunch of other ways to go about this, but you are going to have to do something to get your sample clean. No matter what your sample is, it's not clean enough yet, unless you just grew it in the, in the uh, MPE. Okay, cool. So that's the preliminaries out of the way. What the heck is this thing? So here I've got a diagram of the inside of the thing, and I'm just going to ask for a quick show of hands. Who here has seen a talk about an electron microscope before? Okay, very few people. Right. So a lot of these terms are common terms in electron microscopes, and if you attend electron microscope talks, you're going to hear all these terms before. I will add a little bit of explanation then, since people aren't so familiar. So. To make an electron microscope, you need, broadly speaking, three things. You need something that spits out electrons to make the electron beam. You need lenses, like any microscope, to focus the beam and magnify up the image. And you need some way of getting an image into the beam, meaning some way to interact with the sample. These gray U-shaped objects I have labeled as lenses, these are magnets. Glass lenses do not work on electrons. The electrons bonk into the glass and stop. So if we want to bend the path of an electron beam, we use very strong magnetic fields that we shape very carefully, and the beam's path gets bent, and we can do focusing and all the other things you do with glass lens, except not nearly as well, using magnetic lenses. We also have a somewhat unusual thing on this microscope, which is a prism. This works more or less the way that optical prisms do. It bends the radiation going through it. It also disperses it. What does that mean? If you shine white light into a prism, what happens? You get a rainbow which means it splits it out by energy and actually physically moves the different energy photons apart. This was going to do the same thing to electrons, and we'll take advantage of that later. Mostly, though, it's here because to interact with the sample, since we only want to interact with the top surface, we need to bounce off it and come back out again. How are we going to do that? We're going to do it like this. Uh, our electron gun that makes our electron beam is going to have 15,000 volts on it, actually between the gun and a thing called an anode, I assume. People know the term anode, the positive side of a positive negative electrostatic pair. Uh, that's going to mean we're going to have electric field lines between the gun and the anode. And when the electrons come out, they're going to accelerate it up to 15 kilovolts because I'm a physicist and energy is in voltage sometimes. So there we go. There are 15 kilovolts worth of speed, kinetic energy, however you want to call it. And then on the stage, we're also going to have 15 kilovolts. OK, cool, fine. What else? We're also going to have magnetic fields. Inside each of these lenses, we're going to have curved magnetic fields to act as lenses. And then the prism is going to have a bunch of dots. And in conventional physics iconography, having dots means the lines of electric field are coming right out of the page towards your face. So these field lines are coming at you. <laughs> Has anyone here heard the term Lorentz force before? Who's not a microscopist? A few people. All right. Um, 
Lorentz force is the idea that if a charged particle passes through a magnetic field, uh, it will experience a force at right angles to both the field and its direction of motion, which means if an electron comes down like this, its motion vector is down, the magnetic field vector is out of the page, it's going to experience a force sideways, it's going to bend sideways. And that's why this is a prism. Cool. Okay. So now this is what's inside the tool. There's also a detector way down here at the bottom, and all these lenses have names, but you don't really need to worry too much about what those names mean. For the purposes of this talk, if you, if you do microscopy, you're going to have to learn. Okay, great. So how do we make pictures with this thing? There's actually two main ways we can make pictures of this thing. Anywhere there's 15 kilovolts, we can make electrons come out and use them to take pictures. So the simplest way is to just start with electrons that are already on our sample and pull them out. And we do that by shining some light on our sample, some quite bright light from mercury arc lamp. It's white light, but has a lot of UV. And because of a thing called the photoelectric effect, which was first you know, described in detail like 100 years ago, there's a paper, some guy, it's a big deal, whatever, look it up. Uh, electrons will come out, and then they will do what I just said. They will go into this prism, they will bend downward. This final lens will spread them out and shine them on an electron detector, which is connected to your computer, and now you have a picture. Cool, straightforward enough. What if we want to use the other half of this instrument? Fine. Then electrons come out of the gun, go through various lenses, right angle through the prism, and get to your sample. And this is where things get a little weird. Because if we just shot 15 kilovolt electrons at your sample, they're going an appreciable fraction of the speed of light. They're just going to smash into your sample, and that's going to be that. We want to actually image something. We need to turn your sample into an electron mirror and send the electrons back. And that's why we had this 15 kilovolts on it. That way, the electrons are going to come in at 15 kilovolts. They're going to go into this electric field. They're going to slow way down. And then they're going to turn around and go back at the same speed, same energy anyway. Give or take a little. We actually deliberately turn this voltage up and down as we're operating this tool for reasons we'll get into. But that's lean. That's your low energy electron microscopy. And 15 kilovolts is a lot of energy. But we call it low energy because it's this 15 opposed to that 15. If they're exactly the same, then the actual electrons slow down to zero right above the sample, or one volt or two volts or something. And that is a very low amount of energy if you're an electron. So far, so good. Uh, as a reminder, this is what the thing actually looks like. So electron guns up here, lenses, lenses, prism is this box, actual sample is in here. Here's the mercury arc lamp. There's a stage, which is a little motorized platform that your sample sits on, so you can move it around under the lens. You can't reach in and move it with your hands because everything's under vacuum. And also at 15,000 volts, you could zap. Uh, so you have to use a little motorized stage. So it has X, Y, Z, and two tilt axes. It does not have azimuth or uh, in-plane rotation, which um, actually matters for some of the applications. So here's all the kinds of signals you can get off your sample. And I'm not going to belabor this too much because there's a lot of acronyms up here that aren't going to make much sense until later. Okay. Um, but briefly belaboring it, the landing energy, meaning the actual energy the electrons interact with the sample at after that whole speed them up, slow them down, send them back routine, is anywhere from zero volts, where they barely interact with it at all, kind of hover above the surface before they leave, to about yeah, 100 volts, they go into it a bit and then get shot back out. Um, we also get a phenomenon called diffraction. Has anyone ever heard of this before? Excuse me, who hasn't heard of this before? Absolutely everyone knows what diffraction is. Oh, that's great. Now I don't have to do too much on that. All right, so we also get diffraction because the electrons are still waves. They're plane waves in addition to being particles. They're coherent, and they are more or less all of the same wavelength because they're all the same energy-ish. And that means we get a diffraction pattern if your sample is a crystal, which is really useful because it means you can learn a lot about the crystal structure of your sample and do a bunch of really cool imaging techniques with acronyms. Uh, and then if we're using the PEAM gimmick where we shine light on it first, we get photoemitted electrons. And we also can pull those off and do a gimmick called ARPES, which I will talk about. There's some spectroscopies you can do with this. There's energy filtering you can do. You can also put in apertures to do micro ARPES. If you know what ARPES is, this is that, but with very small spatial areas being probed. All right, let's, let's start breaking down these acronyms. The simplest uh, type of microscopy you do on this tool, the first one you do when you set the tool up every day is called photoelectron emission microscopy. How does that work? Um, I got two little diagrams up here. I've got 
a sample, which I've listed as silicon carbide. I got two sheets graphene sitting on it. I got 15,000 volts. Cool. That's our sample. And it's got an electron in it because everything has electrons in it, more or less. And that electron is bound to the material. It can't leave. Electrons don't just randomly leave and wander off into space very often, right? I mean, you, you would, we'd notice if they did. Um, the reason they don't leave is that that electron is in what's called the valence band. And I've drawn a band diagram here, and maybe not as many people are familiar with these. I'm not going to go into too much detail. If you are familiar with it, you'll know what we're talking about. Um, this electron has an energy down here on the energy axis. And to get out of the sample, it needs an energy above this blue line called the work function. This is how much energy you got to give an electron to eat it right the heck out of your sample and send it in space. Yeah. Um, OK, cool. If we take some light, and that light is high enough energy, meaning blue or purple enough, we can take that electron, it can absorb the light, and up it goes. Now it has more energy than the work function, and now it's not bound to the sample anymore. And now it's not bound to the sample, it can feel this 15 kilovolts, and it can get launched right on out of the sample and then go into our optics and through our prism and onto our detector, and now we have a picture, hooray. We are shining white light, which means broad spectrum light, which means some of the light, the energy is too low, compared to this work function. And so electrons that absorb that energy don't come out. Uh, other light is enough and they come out with varying amounts of energy above the work function. It is not continuous, but that's fine. You don't have to worry about it. There we go, it comes out and here we go. We got a peam image. It looks like this. This is what one of the pictures of peam looks like. And all these images are gonna be grayscale, black and white. Um, again, it seems like not a lot of people have done electron microscopy before. So I'm just gonna go ahead and tell you, get used to grayscale. Uh, there is such a thing as color in the world of electron microscopy. You can have different energy electrons, um, but it, it plays merry hell with your optics. So we always use, as best we can, monochromated single color uh, electrons, and therefore we get monochrome images. You can false color them later if that you know you enjoy that sort of thing. Uh, why do we have contrast? We have contrast because there's two different materials here. There's silicon carbide and there's graphene that has grown on it, and the graphene is this sort of rather uh, spindly, raggedy stuff because it hasn't been grown in a big continuous layer. It's only in some parts. The work function of graphene is different than the work function of silicon carbide, which means if we shine the same light on both, we're gonna get different numbers of electrons coming out. And that means we get different contrast and we can see what we're doing. However, the fact that the electrons are coming out with different energies from each other means that as they pass through the prism, they get spread apart because prisms spread things of different colors apart. And that messes with our spatial resolution. And so our ability to focus this thing down and get a really good picture is a little limited. We're talking spatial resolutions, tens of nanometers, which is still pretty good, but not as good as you know other instruments are capable of. All right, so that's peen. Here's some peen images. Here's some things you might want to do with peen. Uh, on the left, we have an image of a metal alloy called Inconel. This is a nickel alloy with a bunch of other stuff in it. Uh, it's used in high temperature and corrosive environments like inside of jet turbines or car exhausts or reactors or other places where you want something that isn't going to melt or corrode. And its surface is extremely important because anything bad that happens to the stuff is going to start the surface. So you're going to want to watch the surface and get it hot. And in PEAM, we have some contrast. This is all the same material but it has differently oriented crystal grains in it. And the fat different sides of each crystal grain have different work functions. And so you get this light to dark contrast and we can actually just go ahead and see it. Or maybe you want to look at a device. These, can I turn down the front lights up here? Excuse us a sec. We're going to try turning some lights on and off for a moment. Are you going to let me? Uh, well, okay, now we get all the lights off. Is that okay? Yeah, all right. Uh, easy to see with this. So these little dark striped shapes in between all the big lines are little tiny sections of graphene that someone very carefully shaped in the clean room. And then they attached these gold contact leads to them so they could do electrical measurements on their interesting graphene. But we can image it directly. We can look at its surface. We can do all the various crazy microscopy tricks this cool tool is capable of right on your graphene. However, in this instrument, the only source of material contrast, meaning one material versus another material, is this work function contrast. When we go to the other imaging methods, we're not going to necessarily get contrast between, say, the gold here and the material under it, uh, unless they're very different heights or we do some sort of crystal stuff. There is another way to get electrons out of a material. <clears throat> 
uh, you can boil them out. If your material gets really, really, really hot, like glowing orange to yellow hot, uh, 900,000 degrees, uh, electrons will just boil out of it because they get enough kinetic energy from the heat around them to just leave. Uh, this is called theme, thermionic electron emission microscopy. It's interesting. This is a piece of a material called aluminum nitride, which is decomposing because it's at 1100 C and you get very, very strong emission where the edges of it are starting to come apart. Is it useful? I know one guy in the world who makes like use of this fairly regularly. Um, but hey, it, it's something you can do. Maybe you'd like to try it. I don't know. I mentioned this stuff, ARPEZ. And I, I, this is a significantly more complex use of this tool. But I'm putting it here because it's also a photo emission technique. So it all seems to match. Um, the acronym stands for Angle Resolve Photoelectron Spectroscopy. And at least the word photoelectron should be familiar now. Um, but as for the rest of it, OK, what, what are we doing? So same picture of graphene, silicon carbide. There's our bound electron. But now I've thrown the prism in, which will give you a hint that we're going to be dispersing stuff by energy. And this time, uh, we need significantly higher energy light. We can't get away with just a lamp. Uh, now we need a helium plasma. And we need to be putting out 20, 40 higher energy light. So this is very, very UV light. Uh, this is quite harmful to you. But luckily, it's in the vacuum chamber. It's all shielded. Um, this technique is frequently done at synchrotrons, where you can produce light of pretty much any color you want with ridiculous intensity. This is not as good as that. But it's available here. OK, so we got this high energy light. Why? All right, well, here's our electron, same one, in this sort of energy diagram. And for again, for people who are not so familiar with this kind of formalism, uh, you'll, you'll get it in solid state physics. This axis is how much energy. This axis is more or less how much momentum the electrons have uh, moving around inside the system. And this arc uh, are the allowed combinations of electron energy and momentum that things are permitted to have because of quantum mechanics inside this particular material. Cool. All right, so there's our electron. Purple photon hits it. Up it goes, considerably higher now because this is a much more energetic photon. But so far, same concept, yeah? But. If you take an electron that's a little bit over to one side, has a little bit less energy and a little bit more momentum, and jump it up, OK, it's going to rise the same amount and end up at a slightly lower energy. And critically, it's going to conserve its momentum, because momentum is conserved. That's one of those rules. And you can keep doing this. OK, so what? So now we have a whole bunch of electrons that spit off this surface. Now we're back in the real space world, not this funky energy momentum space. And they're all going to come off together. But when they pass through the prism, we're actually going to do something funny. We put a slit here because that helps us split the two axes of energy and momentum from each other. We send them through it, and they spread out. And they spread out into the same arc shape that they had back here in energy and momentum space, which now means we have a real sort of xy position image of something which was a very complicated physics construct, the band structure of our sample. And it looks like this. Uh, this faint line up here is the one that matters. Uh, this is from one of these instruments. And I say it's faint. It's faint. You have to know what you're looking for. If you go to a synchrotron, you can put out more light than the sun locally and get a much stronger line than this. Uh, but again, we're working on a lab scale tool. But this is the valence band structure of a piece of material. You're just directly imaging it, which is pretty cool. Uh, so here's one. Um, this is valence band structure from graphene. Uh, this is something else, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, again, not as good as you can get at a dedicated ARPA synchrotron facility, but you can do it all at the same time inside this one instrument here at CNS, which is pretty neat. Um, by trickery, you can take this fairly simple little diagram here, and you can convert it into a bunch of what are called Z-cuts, which are planes in the energy axis that cut through momentum space, and you can see all these interesting features of your valence structure. And if you're familiar with graphene, you'll notice we got your table cones and direct points and so on all represented here. That's real nice. You can do a complementary term, and then we're going to get away from all this spectroscopy stuff, uh, called R-Res, which is Angle Resolved Reflected Electron Spectroscopy. And um, you know, given the audience, I'm not going to go into the details too much, except to say this is the equivalent for conduction bands. So you can also map the conduction band directly in this tool and image it, which is neat under certain conditions. 
Okay, moving on. So that's PIM. How about LEAM? How does that work? Well, all right, this time the electron doesn't start in our sample, it starts in our gun. And we're going to shoot it down at 15 kilovolts. We still got this 15 kilovolts, and it's going to do one of these. And it's going to bounce off the high voltage on our sample. And this is how far down it got. That's sort of the lowest point the electron reached under this set of conditions where these are exactly matched. And it just barely, barely tickles the upper surface of the sample. In fact, it may not interact with the sample at all, but only interact with the electric fields. And it makes a picture that looks like this. We call this mirror mode. It's very bright because we're basically staring back at the electron beam the whole time because we're bouncing it off the sample. But there's texture in it. You see all these little fizzy texture details. And that is because the sample is, of course, not perfectly flat. It has some stuff on it. There's no point looking at a perfectly flat sample of one material usually. And the stuff on the surface of the sample modifies the local electric field lines. And that, in turn, changes the mirroring effect that this has on the electron beam. And so we get some texture. OK, that's nice. But that's not what we're here to do. We're here to actually learn something about the material, not the electric fields around it. So we're going to take another electron. This time, we're going to lower the voltage on our stage by 2 volts, which doesn't sound like much. And it's not much, but it matters quite a bit. So the electrons going to come down. It's going to do its bouncing trick. But this time, in our little picture with graphene and so on, it got far enough down that it starts to interact fairly strongly with the first layer of graphene. And that gives us this picture. Interesting. What are we looking at? Bright is anywhere where the electrons bounced back up into the, into the detection optics. Dark is anywhere where electrons didn't, meaning something absorbed them, meaning there was some sort of state available in the material that can absorb electrons at these energies. And we can keep doing this. I can keep animating in PowerPoint for some reason. And as we do it, our electrons are going to get deeper and deeper into the sample, and we're going to interact with different states at different physical and energetic levels inside the sample. And we get a whole stack of pictures and the point I'm making here is interpreting lean images is not trivial. You don't interpret one image. You do energy series, you do a bunch of other stuff, and then you sit there and figure out what it all means. This is not a very straightforward type of microscopy. It's very useful. You have to believe me. I'll show you why it's very useful. So here's a, now I'm going to try and play a movie in PowerPoint. So everybody pray for him. Here we go. Hey, all right, this is an energy series. Each frame is another 100 millivolts worth of electron energy. This is silicon carbide with graphene on it and not very uniformly on it. You'll notice we got a bunch of different areas. We've got some nice hexagonal edges on them because of graphene. We got little spindly bits and the energy is just going up and up and up and up. And we're working our way deeper and deeper into the graphene and things are getting brighter and darker and so on. So this is a data cube x and y, and then z axis is energy. What do we do with it? Well, all right. Say we take those pixels right there, and we just project their intensity against energy, and we're going to get this. And this is an reflected electron spectroscopy curve. And what do we see? We see that right here at the beginning, at very low energy, everything's very bright because we're in mirror mode, it's bouncing the beam back. And then it comes down. We go out of mirror mode. We start interacting with the sample. Then there's a big dip, and then it comes back up again. OK, so what? Well, how about over here? Over here, we got two dips. How about that spot? Three dips, although this one's not very much of a dip, but it counts. OK, so what? What would all these dips mean? Well, everywhere there's a dip, it means that at that particular depth into the sample, there were empty states that an electron could get absorbed into. And so happens those particular empty states are the gap between a layer of graphene and the top layer of bonded carbon atoms attached to the silicon carbide, which means the number of dips corresponds to the number of graphene layers. So this means we can actually count our layers of graphene with monolayer accuracy, any pixel we want on this image. We can have a nice map of graphene thickness, non-destructively, very straightforward way to do it, with very high resolution, which is fairly neat. There are many other things we can do with these curves, but here's a simple application. OK. Let's put it together with some other stuff, like the heating stage, and see what we might do with just lean. Uh, this is actually a PEAM image of gold on silicon nitride. Why do we think it's a PEAM image? Why am I showing you a PEAM image? No guess. OK, it's because lean does not do work function contrast, which means it's very hard to tell two different materials apart just from a single lean image. Whereas PEAM image, you can see this is gold. That's silicon nitride. Silicon nitride's work function is 7-ish. 
gold's work function is five and change, depending on how you made it and if it's dirty or not. So gold is brighter than silicon nitride because the same color of light can get more electrons out of the gold than can silicon nitride. Nice. So then we take this and we heat it really hot, take it up to about 900 C. And what happens? The gold does not chemically bond to silicon nitride. This gold doesn't chemically bond to much. That's sort of the point. Instead, it becomes mobile and it starts moving around and it clusters up into little droplets and forms these islands. It's a very, very simple material science, surface science experiment, de-wetting of gold. Uh, okay, cool. But we can watch it happen in real time. So this is a lean video of this actually happening. This is the original gold film. And this is where it has gotten sucked away and is starting to cluster up and make droplets. And you'll notice the image quality is absolutely fine. You can see little dendritic structures on the surface where the gold is kind of being channeled away. Uh, these are the high points. You've got these weird light shadows around them. They're sticking up out of the surface now and distorting the electric field line. So you get funny business with the reflected electron beam. But I would say it's fairly neat to be able to watch in real time a surface phenomenon like de-wetting. Anyway, I think so, but I'm a material scientist. Okay, cool. So that's something you can do. Let's move on. Another acronym, LEAD. And this is why I asked everyone if they knew what the fraction was. I'm not going to do an intro to diffraction because that would take a while. But quick reminder, if you take a beam of monochromatic radiation, uh, ideally coherent, and you shine it on something like a crystal that has a bunch of repeated structure in it, you're going to get the original beam bounced back elastically, we hope. But you're also going to get some additional beams. And they're going to come off at angles. And the angle they come off on depends on the spacing in this crystal following something called Bragg's Law, which we're not going to do too much with here. OK, cool. So all these conditions apply inside the lead. We, if you've got a crystal and sample, you've got crystal. We certainly have our beam of electrons, which means we should be getting these. And in fact, we do. And this actually causes a problem. All of those electrons are, from the tool's perspective, just electrons. They go through the optics the same way, which means that not only do we get our main beam that gives our main images, we also get those diffracted beams. They get magnified up the same way through the optics. And that means we get several different images slightly offset from each other projected onto the detector and makes everything blurry, kind of like this. Here's an image, lean image, that's just got all the different beamlets from this crystal on top of each other. And there's not a heck of a lot of contrast. There's a little texture here and there, maybe. OK, well, we're going to have to do something about that. And the thing we can do about it is we can take an aperture. If you do electron microscopy, you're going to make friends with apertures. An aperture is just a piece of metal with a hole in it. And we shove it into the beam to produce a variety of effects. In this case, we put it right around that central beam and block these diffracted ones. And once those are blocked, we get much better contrast. This is the exact same area, the exact same sample. But now you can actually see what's going on because we don't have all those diffracted beams cluttering the place up. OK, we call that bright field lean for in contrast to something else, which we'll get to in a couple of slides. But what if instead we were actually interested just in the spacing of those diffracted beams? After all, it has something to do with our crystal structure. We can change the setting of this lens and just let the beams themselves shine on our detector without magnifying them up into images. And that gives us what we call a lead pattern, a low energy electron diffraction pattern with the central beam which is that orange one, and then a bunch of spots coming from the different diffracted beams. The spacing between these and the angle between these can be converted back to learn about the crystal structure of the sample. And as a reminder, this is the crystal structure of the top atomic modulator of your sample, not the whole crystal. The insides of crystals are these beautiful places where things are nice and uniform over very long distances. The surfaces of crystal are these terrifying hellscapes where nothing applies anymore and surface energy rules the day and God only knows what's going on, but this is a way to find out, which is fairly cool. There is going to be one bit of terminology I'm going to point out here for people who are real familiar with diffraction. There is this concept when you take a diffraction course or many microscopy courses called the Ewald sphere, and they'll teach you about it and then you'll never use it because you generally don't need to. Um, what the heck is this? All right. Imagine we have all these possible diffracted spots that could show up on our screen. For electrons of a given energy, there is an arc shape, or if we take this whole thing and spin it, uh, that would become a sphere, right? But we're just gonna do it in 2D here because I don't like drawing in 3D. There's this arc shape whose radius depends on the electron energy. And 
any spots that that arc passes through will actually show up on your screen, and the ones it doesn't pass through won't. And this is why you don't always just get infinite beautiful spots of all the same color or all the same brightness on your screen. If we change the energy of our electrons, the size of the sphere changes, the flatness of the arc changes, and maybe we can hit some more spots. Normally, in electron microscopes, we're not free to do this. We don't get to just dial the energy of our electron gun up and down because it messes with all the other lenses, it destabilizes the gun, it's bad news. On the lean, we can vary this pretty much as we like because we're not changing the energy of the electron gun, we're changing the energy on the sample. And that affords us some rather interesting capabilities. Uh, one thing I should point out, by the way, this kind of construction where diffracted spots in this space are these perfect little points is only true for perfectly kinematic diffraction, don't worry what that is, and for an infinitely large, perfectly ordered crystal, which doesn't exist, as far as I know. Um, in the real world, instead of being these little spots, uh, these are actually these sort of elliptical, almost stretched out spindle-shaped zones called rel rods, which is another term you might've heard once in a diffraction course and never again, uh, which is very fortunate because since they have some actual vertical extent in this construction, it means that we can actually intersect them with our little disks. So I've drawn it quick schematic. If we're on the E0 arc, we'll get the center spot and two beside it. E1 arc, we're still getting the center and two beside, but now we've moved into the thicker part, so the spots are brighter. We go to E2 arc, we start to pick up some extra reflections. Well, that's neat. But again, you never see this in normal electron microscopy or X-ray diffraction, because you're never messing around with your radiation's wavelength. But in lean, we can do it all we want. In lean, we can do it. So this is a crystal with five volt electrons hitting it. See, we got our center spot. We got a bunch of nice reflections. Turn up to 10 volts. The illuminated area gets larger because we've made our e volt sphere larger. And now we can start to pick up additional spots. Take it up to 30 volts. Take it up to 40 volts. It gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Not only do more spots show up, the relative intensities of the spots start to change all over the place in complicated ways. And there's a lot of information embedded in that that you can pull out if that's the kind of thing you like to do. OK, moving along. What else do we do with this diffraction capability? I mentioned bright field lean, right? You already saw this bit. Cool. Uh, straightforward enough. How do you actually do that? The way you actually do it is you take an aperture, this one, and you put it into your column so that only this central beam from the diffracted set goes through, which is our zeroth order elastically scattered beam, and it gives you this nice high finest image. But what if, for some reason, you decided to put the aperture around one of these spots? OK, now what happens? Well, now what happens is you block everything except the electrons that fulfill that diffraction condition, which means only electrons which came bounced off a part of your sample that had exactly that crystal spacing and exactly that orientation are going to show up on your screen. Everything else is going to be black because there won't be any electrons there. And that's what we call this dark field. This is a sample of graphite, uh, POPG, highly oriented pyrolytical, pyrolytic graphite, I think. Yeah. Um, it has graphite, graphene, all over its top surface. But it has random in-plane rotations by 60 degrees. See the 60 degree angles between these spots. If we pick off one diffracted spot, we will get light only from those sections of graphite that are in that particular orientation. And so we can actually start to see the size of our graphite domains. OK, neat, neat, I guess. Why would we want to do that? All right, well, let's talk about why you might want to do that. Um, I'm going to be doing a lot of graphene on silicon carbide because it's like bread and butter. It's our calibration sample, and it shows a lot of these effects really well. Uh, here's some graphene actually growing on silicon carbide. You can see here on the left, we've got this nice triangle with truncated points. It's nucleated off of some flaw in the silicon carbide there. It's been growing outward at whatever, 1400 degrees or something. It's got this very beautiful, very complicated diffraction pattern because there's graphene, which is a, an ordered material, like 2D crystal, sitting on top of a different ordered material. And so you get extra spots from the sort of spacings between those two. But if we were to do dark field and look at the, one of the graphene spots, you see all these dark and light triangles going on? Those are places where you have two layers of graphene with some twist angle between them. And they're not sitting exactly on top of each other. They are misoriented by some amount. And by looking at the size of the triangles and the orientation of the triangle, you can actually directly measure how much they're misoriented by. And this is kind of hot stuff these days, deliberately twisted bilayer graphene. 
again, we can not only just count the layers, we can directly measure their misorientation without having to do anything else to them in this. Uh, okay, here's a weird lead pattern. Why is this one weird? It's weird because we got pairs of spots rather than single spots. That means that we have one type of crystal structure, but it comes in two slight rotations from each other. So that instead of one set of spots, we get two and not continuous rotations it's either this way or it's that way. If we pick those off and we look at them on this particular crystal, you'll see there are areas that have that orientation and areas that have the other one. Okay, cool, cool. Then what? Well, let's say we wanted to know everything there is to know about only one of these orientations. We can't learn it from this pattern because it's got both in them. Any information it might have about an the one is overlaid by the other and it's all blurry and confusing. So how do we always solve problems in electron microscopes? With an aperture. Yes, we're going to take an aperture. We're going to actually put a different aperture much farther up the electron optics path that only allows electrons from this part of the sample to go into our optics. And then we can take the diffraction pattern of that. And that means we are getting a local diffraction pattern. We're only learning about that particular spot's crystallography. This is called selected area electron diffraction, or SAED. Uh, the smallest area we can do is sort of 150-ish nanometer in diameter. It's not super duper small. You're not going to be doing nanoparticles, but quite good enough for, uh, for most crystalline materials. So let's put it all together. Let's do everything at once. Why not? We're going to do lead. We're going to do dark field. We're going to do it on silicon because we know a lot about silicon. We're really good at silicon. Uh, what are we looking at here? So silicon's interesting. If you look at the 100 surface of a piece of silicon, uh, as you go between the different layers of atoms, layer one, layer two, et cetera, the crystalline order of the silicon rotates by 90 degrees. We call it ABAB packing. You go down a layer, you got the same crystal, but now it's turned 90 degrees in plane, then it goes back. If we do lead and pick off one of these spots, what that means is if we look at the surface, we get to see a transition from bright to dark every time a single layer of atoms appears or goes away. The surfaces of all materials are slightly hilly, slightly wavy down at the atomic level. Having an absolutely flat down of the atom surface is not impossible, but very unlikely. And so what you have here is a topographic map down to the single atomic terrace of a piece of silicon. Neat. Okay, cool. Um, incidentally, getting this, remember I mentioned much earlier, things have to be clean. Uh, silicon comes with silicon oxide on it always. You have to get rid of that. Otherwise, all you see is silicon oxide, which is amorphous and very boring. You get rid of that by heating this up to 1400 C and dissolving the oxide back into the silicon, which is kind of crazy. But then you're under UHV, so there's no oxygen around, so it doesn't reform for a while. So that's cool. If you hold this at 1100 and you just sit there watching it, you get something rather pretty. And remember, each one of these dark light transitions is a single atomic step. These are single atomic steps of silicon moving around. A terrace is growing and reforming and so on. It's trying to flatten itself out. It's trying to get rid of steps because steps cost energy at this temperature. But you may notice there's these linear features in here as well. This silicon is contaminated, deliberately contaminated with some iron and it's growing silicides on its surface, and those are a different material, and they block the movement of the silicon terraces. So they bounce off it like they're in a maze, and they zoom all around. Again, if you're a material scientist or a surface scientist, this is pretty incredible. This is actually watching a thing that you read about in your textbooks happen in real time in front of you, and in a quantitative way. Uh, incidentally, after the fact, if you go look at PEAM, remember we don't get contrast between different material compositions in lean. Uh, this is a lower mag peam image. You can see all these little needles of iron psilocybin that have grown everywhere just to, you know, satisfy yourself. That's what they really are. Cool. So that's a heck of a lot of acronyms and a lot of microscopy. We're getting close to the end of this talk, uh, but we're going to just a little more. I'm going to do an example, uh, an example of a real material and a real problem that was really solved using the, uh, this is a material from the Hoffman Group at Harvard. Um, this work was done with Dr. Monkalu. Uh, thank you very much, Monk. It's a very cool material, very cool problem. This is a material called uranium oxytelluride. Okay, weird. Uh, this is one of these flaky layered materials that you can peel apart with tape uh, if you're so inclined. And it's an interesting material because it has what are called charge density waves in it. In other words, the actual uh, density of 
charge of electrons uh, varies in a sort of ripply wave-like fashion as you go along the surface at a very small scale, sort of 10 nanometer scale. You can see these with a different technique called scanning tunneling microscopy, which this group is an expert in. Um, but that technique has exquisitely high resolution, but a very small field of view. And so the question was raised, are these just tiny little local things? Are they identical across large areas of the sample? What's going on? Right, well, so you have a PEAM image. This is part of that sample. It's got a step in it where flake peeled off. We do bright field lean, same step. Okay, you know, doesn't look like much. We're gonna go to dark field because it turns out these charge density waves are actually the result of small periodic distortions in the crystal, which means if we do dark field, we can actually see the domains. Each one of these little funny squiggly S structures is an area in which you have one orientation of charge density waves. And they're at 90 degrees to each other. And you see in the diffraction pattern, you've got these nice cross uh, signals. The spots for the charge density waves are actually quite close to the primary spots. That's because they are at long periodicities relative to atoms. Uh, diffraction patterns are live in inverse space where things that are far apart in the real world are close together in diffraction patterns. It's weird. So that's pretty neat. We can actually directly image these. We can image them on the micron scale. We can see that sometimes there's very tiny ones, kind of 100 nanometer. Sometimes there's ones that are several microns long. And sometimes there's whole areas that are just one orientation. Now we can go around mapping them. So then the question was raised, OK, uh, this is at room temperature we're doing this. Do they survive getting hot? Like, when do these stop happening? Do they survive getting cold? OK, well, here we go. Here's one of those patterns, right? These nice dark field beam, like we just discussed. Here's those domains at 0 Celsius. And here it is at 120 Kelvin, or minus 153 Celsius, which is as cold as this tool will go. Again, for our serious hardcore cryo people out there, this is not very cryo. But it's best we can do in this tool because of the way the lenses work. No change. Exactly the same. Uh, OK, lead pattern. Pretty much the same. Gets a little fuzzier when it's cold because now the sample is cold, starting to condense stuff out of the vacuum. Even this very good vacuum has some stuff in it, and it freezes onto the surface and blurs out our diffraction pattern. Again, we only see the top mono atomic monolayer. So if you get crap on your surface, you're going to see crap diffraction. How about hot? Again, another different area. Uh, 310 Kelvin, so you know, warm but not boiling. Uh, and here we are at. 523 or 250 Celsius. Still there, definitely fuzzier. Um, diffraction pattern still present, definitely fuzzy. This is around the temperature this material starts to actually decompose. The uh, tellurium starts to sublime out or something, and it stops being that material. But what this means is these patterns are present all the way from quite cold until the material literally comes apart in your hands. They're very robust. I'm going to say one more thing. If I have time, I do have time. I'm going to make it time. Uh, sample cleaning. Sample cleaning is the big barrier to entry for this technique. Um, we can cut things to small sizes. We can make things flat, especially if the 2D material is not hard to get flat. They're already flat, but cleanliness is really tough. Um, if we take this same thing I showed you in P before, we look at it in lean. Oh, boy, does that look weird. There is stuff all over this sucker. And that's because, yeah, there's no lead pattern at all because it's so dirty. That is because we need a really atomically clean surface. And this thing was made in a clean room. And the graphene was put there using something called stamp transfer. And things made with stamp transfer are unbelievably dirty, like just, just filthy. They got stuff in between the layers. They got stuff under the layers. They got stuff on the layers. It's terrible. Um, OK, you know, so what? So fix it, right? Um, but unfortunately, most things that we actually want to image don't like getting hot enough to boil carbon off. Carbon's pretty hard to boil. You have to go quite hot to, to boil carbon off of something. Uh, unfortunately, if we actually heat a structure like this, which has different metals and different materials, um, it does this. The metals start to de-wet. Remember, we did a little thing of gold de-wetting? All right, well, here's gold de-wetting starting to happen. And it's going to migrate all over the place, and it's going to cover everything, and then it's just becomes an absolute mess. And you can't see your original sample anymore. So this is a situation where heating just isn't going to cut it. We can't exfoliate in C2 because this was a device that somebody made, right? We're not going to go peeling bits of it off with tape or it won't be the same device. So what the heck do we do about that? Yeah, this is what happens if you keep going. Eventually, there's just junk everywhere. 
So something we're trying, this is new, this is not an established technique, is we're trying removing the surface crap by bombarding it with ion beams. There's kind of two general ways to do this. One is called sputtering, where you have single atoms of like argon or something similar, and you accelerate them up through a voltage and you just whack stuff with them after ionizing them first, excuse me, argon ions. Uh, it's pretty brutal. It will chew up your surface pretty bad and amorphize it, but it does clean it real nice. The alternative is something kind of different, and that's called gas cluster ion beams. These are very funky. Instead of using individual atoms, they actually use big droplets of atoms, like droplets of argon, which is a funny concept. But you can get a droplet of argon containing several thousand individual atoms, ionize it, send it through the same kind of beam optics, and now you got a beam of argon droplets. And the reason that matters is those droplets aren't really bond together in any way. When they hit a sample, they kind of burst like a snowball, and the effect is much, much gentler. There's not a lot of actual data on this. Like these are commercially available products, but there's hardly any data on how this actually affects like surface cleanliness. For that matter, there's hardly any data on how this affects the surface period, which is kind of interesting. Some phenomenological stuff from Sims, but very little hardcore surface data. So, okay, cool. So we did some, we just got barely enough time. We took a very common material, strontium titanate, nice clean crystal. We took it right out of the box, we put it in lean, it has no lead pattern because we just took it out of the box, which means it's got water, it's got dirt, it's got whatever, oil, who knows, all over the surface. Um, you can see some kind of streaky lines passing through that. Those are atomic steps, but you can't really resolve them very well. All right. Um, we tried two different things. We tried just hitting it with the argon sputter gun and chewing it up. Fairly gentle, 300 volts, not bad. Certainly cleaned off the dirt. Now we have a central beam in here. So we're reflecting our electron beam off properly. It's not being absorbed by dirt, but no diffraction pattern, which is not really a surprise because if you cross-section this and put it in the TEM, oh, excuse me, I, a little out of order. No diffraction pattern unless we heat it really, really hot, which we didn't want to do. That was not the point. But if we do heat it really, really hot, we get our crystal back, except now it's weird. It's got all these additional spots all over it shouldn't have because we got a funny surface termination by heating it up so much and also by sputtering it, but whatever. If we look at this sucker in cross-section, what we've got is we've got crystal planes. This is a TEM image, actually a hat of stem image, kind of fancy electron microscopy image. Uh, we got nice crystal planes down here. We got vacuum up there. And in between, we've got this mush. And this is amorphized, smashed, chewed up, ruined strontium titanate. And that's what the monatomic argon beam does to it. When we heated it up, we actually regrew this crystal up through that stuff and converted all this back into crystal but at the cost of ending up with weird crystal and also having to go to 900 C, which is something we didn't want to have to do. But, oh, did this mess up? I you silly thing it did. All right. You know what? The second to last slide, it has to mess up on us. That's all right. We'll just come in here and we'll delete you. And I'll just make my point like this. On the other hand, if you make with the cluster radiation, toss it right in the lean. You don't even do the outgassing to get rid of water, which is kind of surprising. Instant lead pattern, crystal structures preserved. And if you go look at it in cross-section TEM, it's a nice, beautiful crystal right up to the surface there in vacuum. Surface is tiny bit rougher, which is kind of interesting. But we've tried this on transition metal calcogenides. It works great. Tried it on graphene, works great. Tried it on a bunch of stuff. So far, we haven't found anything this doesn't work on in terms of cleaning off your water and your hydrocarbons, the other stuff. Doesn't seem to disturb the crystal structure that we can tell. No heating required. Very nice. Unfortunately, we don't have one of these on the lean, so we have to go between instruments to do it, but it works. All right. Uh, you guys have been really, really patient, and we are right on the end of our time, so we'll do the summary. Lean is low landing energy electron microscopy. We can do all these crazy different tricks with it. We can learn all sorts of stuff about the top surface of our sample. We can do it while it's hot. We can do it while it's cold. We can do work function contrast stuff. We can do all sorts of crazy spectroscopies if we're that kind of physicist. And we're trying to get it so that you can put more and more materials in it rather than just silicon carbide graphene. And that's the end. Uh, anybody's got questions, we'll take them now. Uh, including questions from the Zoom folks if you want to put them in chat for me. Any questions? It's okay if not. We just covered a heck of a lot in a short time. All right, cool. Well, if any occur to you, or if you want to see the thing, or you want to try the thing, or you want to hear me 
curse and swear and bang my knuckles as I put more bits on the thing, uh, you're welcome to stop by. It's a very cool instrument. It's a very unusual capability. Oh, we got a question. Thank you. What's up? When you're having to mangle the terminology, mangle. but when you were when you're exposing with the mercury lamp, yep. Um, can you're using white light from the mercury lamp and then measuring the spectrum based on the excitation at different wavelengths by the materials? So you can do that. You can do um, spectrally resolved PEEM where we put a monochrometer in front of our mercury lamp and we deliberately put red light, yellow light, green light, whatever, and watch parts of the sample light up. And that is one way you can try to measure the work function of your different materials quantitatively. Or you can use the fact that the print, you just put white light on and take advantage of the fact that the prism's a prism and it splits the electrons out anyway. And then you can do quantitative work function measurement by that method, although you have to do some filtering and, and there are slits involved and stuff. But yeah, you can do it either way. They both work. Uh, it has been used on embedded sections, uh, stained embedded sections, and it actually works quite well, surprisingly, uh, on those. So, Are there good. standards of that you're measuring against if you put a uh, unknown from Mars into the into the yeah, so sure. I'm sorry. So the question for people on Zoom was: Are there standards you compare against for work function measurement? Yeah, gold. Gold is the work function reference for most techniques, including XPS, uh, because as long as your gold is reasonably clean, uh, it has a nice, consistent work function that falls right at five point one whatever whatever uh, EV in pretty much everybody's tool. Um, the other thing that's nice is that since we're able to actually turn the voltage on our stage up and down, uh, we can actually just raise and lower that voltage until electrons don't get out anymore. And then we know exactly what energy their work function was. Any other questions? Okay, well, you've been very patient. Thank you for uh, sitting through this rather long talk about a very strange technique. Everybody have a good day.